Paul wiped the slushy out of his eyes. The icy drink dripped down his face and stained his clothes. He glared angrily at Jake Whitman. Jake and his friends stood over him in their matching leather jackets, laughing and clapping each other on the backs. Paul hated them. He wanted to hurt all four of them. But he couldn't. He was too weak to stop them, or even to take on one of them in a fight. So he had to take whatever jokes, insults, or punishments they sent his way. They had been making his life hell for the entire school year. He had been stuffed into a locker, pantsed in the cafeteria, and mocked relentlessly. The only real respite was life outside of school. He had been unlucky enough to run into them that day, though, and they stopped him outside a gas station and threw his drink in his face. He would have given anything in that moment to make them feel an ounce of the torment he had endured. He wanted to make them feel all his pain while he stood there and watched, but there was just nothing he could do. Eventually, his bullies left, but he just continued sitting against the wall outside the gas station, staring at the dumpster. He wanted to let out his anger on something, but all he could do was just clench his fists and cry. He stayed like that for a while, stewing in his anger, and he might have stayed like that until it started to get dark. He knew his parents would be worried, but it was like he was stuck replaying all the times he had been bullied in his mind. He didn't snap out of his trance until he heard a noise off to his right. Paul looked over and saw a tall, skinny man, looking at him with a crazed look in his eyes. He looked haggard, like he hadn't eaten in days, and he seemed to be scared. His pants were torn and ragged, and he wasn't wearing a shirt. Instead, he wore a jacket that looked like it was made out of fur. Paul thought he was a drug addict, and he was afraid the guy might try to rob him for his cash. But the guy ran past him and threw open the dumpster. He seemed to be almost clawing at himself, trying to tear the jacket off his back. He threw it in the dumpster in a panic, and then backed away from the dumpster as quickly as possible. His eyes were wide with terror, and he was breathing so quickly that he looked like he might hyperventilate. He seemed so scared that he didn't even notice Paul for almost a minute. He jumped at Paul, and Paul backed away in fear. The addict seized him by the collar and shook him violently. Don't touch it, he shouted at Paul. You hear me? Don't touch it or people will die. Get off me, Paul cried out, but the addict wouldn't let him go. Swear, he shouted. Swear you won't touch it. All right, all right, Paul said. I won't touch it. Just leave me alone. The addict let go of him and backed away quickly. He looked around nervously like he was afraid he was being stalked and then ran away. Paul wondered what he was high on and if the cops were chasing him. But if they were, he was long gone. Paul was stunned by the encounter, but he eventually stood up and looked around. Sure enough, there was no sign of the addict. He walked over to the dumpster to see what was so important about the jacket. He picked it out of the trash. It was relatively clean, considering it had just been worn by a drug addict and thrown inside a gas station dumpster, and Paul held it up to examine it. It looked almost like a pelt. It looked nice, and it felt comfortable in his hands. As he looked at the jacket and ran his fingers through the fur, his heart began to race and he felt a rush of excitement surge through him. The addict must have shaken him up more than he thought. He took a deep breath and stepped away from the dumpster. He was fascinated with the jacket and he couldn't tear his gaze away from it. He thought back to the addict's warning and wondered why he had been so terrified of a piece of clothing. He must have been on drugs and thought it was an actual wolf. That was the only explanation for why he would want to get rid of it. Paul thought about trying to find him to give it back. But the addict was long gone, and he certainly didn't seem all that interested in getting it back. Paul shrugged his shoulders and tucked the jacket under his arm. He left the gas station and walked home. It was a little late, but there was no helping that. Paul just hoped he wouldn't have to explain to his mom what had happened between him and Jake, or with him and the junkie. He would have to come up with something. He wasn't supposed to be out so late after school. But he knew that his mom would worry even more if she knew he was being bullied. And he could only imagine how frightened she would be if she found out that he had taken a jacket from a strange man that was high out of his mind. She would probably ground him for a year if she found out about that. Paul just didn't want her to worry about him. He could take care of himself, and he didn't need his mother to come in and protect him from everything. He turned back over the events of the day in his mind. Bullies, junkie, jacket. Bullies, junkie, jacket. Over and over. He had to do something about his bullies. They could make his life a waking nightmare in school, but following him after to a gas station was too far. Still, what could he do about it? If he told his parents, they would go to the school and try to stop it. And if the school did anything, then he would look like some pathetic loser who needed his mommy to protect him. He couldn't exactly confront them either. There were four of them, and he couldn't even take the weakest of them in a fight. He didn't know what he could do about the problem, but he didn't want to get kicked around by them everywhere he went. The junkie wasn't a huge problem. As long as his mom didn't find out that the guy existed, Paul would be all right. Still, he was slightly concerned by the guy. His town had a slight problem with drugs, but actually running into an addict was rare, and you certainly didn't find one in broad daylight. He looked scared, too. Maybe he was scared of the police. Paul definitely would have liked to believe that, but he doubted the guy had actually given the police a second thought. He doubted the police could have even detained him for too long either. He seemed to be more concerned about the jacket, almost like he thought it was alive. Paul was pretty sure the guy wouldn't have reacted as strongly if he were carrying a live cobra. Paul figured the guy must have been high, 
But he didn't look like he was high. He just looked scared. If he was high, then he did a pretty good job of hiding it. Still, if the guy wasn't high, then what could have been so bad about a jacket that he would react so strongly? What could make someone so scared of a piece of clothing? Paul wondered if the jacket were stolen, or evidence for some crime. It might explain why the guy was so hysterical and why he might want to get rid of it. But he seemed scared that Paul might take it, and that didn't really make sense. It didn't really look like evidence either. There was no blood or gore or anything. In fact, the jacket might have been the nicest thing the junkie owned. It was warm and looked almost tailor-made. He doubted it was stolen either, otherwise the junkie wouldn't have left it behind. Paul wondered if there was something special about it. He felt a rush of excitement and adrenaline when he had touched the jacket. But that might have just been his nerves from being grabbed by a strange man in an alley. Whatever had scared the addict didn't really matter as far as Paul was concerned. He saw no reason to leave the jacket behind just sitting in the trash. He got home and threw it in his hamper. After he got a shower, he took his slushy stained clothes to the laundry along with his new jacket and ran it through the wash. His mom hadn't actually gotten home yet. She had left a message for him on his phone, letting him know where dinner was and when she expected to be home. He was somewhat surprised that his mom would be out so late, but he wasn't going to complain. The less he had to explain to her, the better. He did his homework while waiting on the laundry, but it was hard for him to focus. He kept thinking about the jacket. Finally, when he had finished his homework, he grabbed a chair and watched the dryer finish. As soon as it was done, he snatched the jacket and put it on. It was still warm from the dryer, and it felt good on him. Paul thought the junkie had been too tall and skinny for it to fit him properly, but it seemed to fit Paul's body perfectly. It had a high collar, and it looked like it would look big and padded like a leather jacket, but it contoured to the form of his body and seemed to slim him nicely. He found a mirror and admired himself in it. It was dark black, and the fur was thick and soft. The inside of the jacket was tanned leather, along with the inside of the pockets. He smiled and he looked at himself in the mirror, wondering why anyone would want to throw it away. After a long while staring in the mirror, Paul climbed the stairs to his bedroom and got ready for bed. He was dressed in pajamas, and he had left the jacket on a chair. He turned off the lights and climbed into bed, but he kept thinking about the jacket. He rolled over and stared at it. It definitely was strange, but he couldn't explain why. Still, he felt cold and almost exposed without it. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. He climbed out of bed and put on the jacket again. He felt warmer and more comfortable in it. Feeling more at ease, he climbed back into bed. He felt more tired, and he wanted to fall asleep, but something was still wrong. He was too warm under his blankets. He kicked off the blankets and lay coverless on the bed. It felt better, but he still couldn't quite fall asleep. Angrily, he grabbed the blanket and threw it up in a furled mess on the bed, moving parts of it meticulously to form almost a nest of sorts. Finally, he felt better about it and curled up into a ball. As soon as he was done, he was asleep in a matter of seconds. He didn't remember falling asleep, but he remembered his dream. Paul was standing in the woods. It was the dark of early morning, and the fog clung to the ground. He felt a chill about him, and he realized his jacket was gone. In a panic, he looked around frantically for it, but he couldn't find it. He ran through the woods, trying to find the jacket, but it was nowhere to be seen. Then he stumbled into a clearing in the woods and saw people gathered together. For some reason, he felt safer. He felt like he was being watched, and he felt a reassurance in numbers. As he drew closer, though, he realized who the people were. It was Jake and his three friends, John, Al, and Ryan. There was a fifth person, too. He couldn't see who it was, but he knew they were picking on the kid. He felt anger rise in his chest, and he wanted to go attack the bullies, but he couldn't save the kid. Then the kid started to scream and cry out, and before Paul could stop himself, he was running towards them. As soon as he reached them, he saw the kid's face and realized it was his own. They vanished in a swirl of mist as he ran up to them. He heard them laughing at him, and he turned to look, only they weren't laughing at him exactly. They were laughing at another version of him as they stuffed him in a locker. They pushed him into the locker and tossed a snake inside before locking him in with it. He panicked and screamed, but everyone else just laughed. He stormed over angrily to stop them, but they disappeared. They were replaced by scene after scene of him being bullied, picked on and pushed around. He saw himself get pants in the cafeteria, held down as spit dripped into his face, tied to a flagpole in the middle of winter, and far worse. He wanted to scream, he wanted to murder everyone responsible, but they just danced around him and mocked him. He screamed and they vanished, and he sunk to the ground in tears. He would have kept crying, but he heard a low growl behind him. He turned around in horror to see what was behind him, but it was just his jacket hanging from a tree branch. He got up to see it, but before he had taken a step, the jacket seemed to turn to a liquid and pool in shadows on the ground. Slowly, it began to form into a giant, dark creature, and soon Paul realized he was staring directly at a wolf. It was giant. Standing over six feet tall, it looked large and lean, with a solid, muscular body. It was pure black, but it had yellow eyes and white teeth that seemed to almost glimmer in the darkness. Paul liked dogs, but this wasn't a common household pet. It was a wild, murderous wolf. 
and if he had any notions of it behaving like a dog, they vanished when he looked into its eyes. He knew that looking into a wolf's eyes was a challenge, but he couldn't look away. Something about the wolf drew him to it and left him hypnotized. It padded towards him slowly, growling and baring its teeth. Paul's breath became more quick and frantic, and he thought the wolf would try to kill him. Instead, the wolf stalked by him, ignoring him as if he were nothing. The wolf began to walk to something behind him, and Paul turned to see what it was. He saw the wolf begin to run, and it leapt towards a crowd of people. Paul ran to stop it, but it was already on them. He leapt towards the wolf and grabbed onto it, but the wolf continued to maul the people in the group. Then Paul saw one of the people and realized they were his bullies. It was Jake, John, Al, and Ryan. The wolf was tearing them apart and devouring them. Paul felt anger swell up in him, and he stepped back from the wolf, letting it eat the boys. Soon, all that was left was a bloody mess where the boys had been, and Paul realized the wolf was gone. He stepped back to examine the bodies, but when he looked down, he cried out in shock. He had thick black fur on his arms. He ran until he found a pool of water, and he looked into it. Looking back at him was a large, black wolf. Paul fell out of bed in a panic and clutched his chest. He was still wearing the jacket. He felt startled by the dream. It had been so real. After a moment, the panic subsided and he went about his morning. He took off the jacket and left it on his chair before getting breakfast. As he got dressed and went about his morning, the previous night's dream was stuck in his mind. He had been scared of the wolf, but there was part of him that was drawn to it. He felt frightened when he saw his reflection, but he also felt powerful as the wolf, and he wanted to feel that again. He tried to forget the dream as he got ready for school. He got dressed and was about to step out the door when he ran up to his room and grabbed his jacket. He got to school and carried out his day as normal. He got a couple of strange looks, but no one said anything to him. He had almost made it through the day when Jake and his friends stopped him at his locker. Well, what do we have here? Jake asked. Did mommy buy you a new bib for your drink? Paul usually tried not to fight back, but something felt different for him that day. He closed his eyes slowly and gritted his teeth. Back away, Jacob, he said in a low voice. Or what? he asked, stepping in closer. He put his hand on Paul's shoulders and continued in a tone that was closer to his sneer. What are you going to do? Faster than Paul could process, he whipped around and slammed Jake's face against the locker. Jake's friends backed away in surprise, and Paul was even more surprised by himself. He hadn't intended to grab Jake. He didn't even know that he could. But he didn't feel like stopping. He twisted Jake's arm behind his back and pressed his face even harder into the locker. Paul leaned in close and snarled in Jake's ears. How about we find out together, huh? Paul asked with an edge in his voice. How about we figure it out one finger at a time? Paul grabbed one of Jake's fingers and began to twist and pull violently until it was about to break, but not quite. Jake began to whimper in fear and pain. He would have snapped each one of Jake's fingers, but he heard a teacher shout something at him. Reluctantly, he let Jake go. He walked away, ignoring the teacher and Jake's friends. He just walked slowly towards the door. He felt angry at the teacher for intervening. He felt like he wanted to rip out his throat. He got home and began to seethe. Finally, he realized there was nothing he could do, and despite wanting to murder the five of them, he managed to settle into a fitful sleep. He dreamed he was a wolf again. He was running through the woods, chasing something. He didn't know what, but it was running from him, which meant it was prey. He ran faster and faster, and he felt the excitement in his veins as he raced after the animal. He could picture it in his jaws as he chased it. He could almost taste it, and he began to crave the flesh of the dead animal. The animal was fast, but he was faster, and he could feel himself gaining on it. Finally, it was close enough to jump, and he leapt into the air and tackled the animal to the ground, seizing on its throat with his teeth. He saw that it was a deer, and he began to rip and tear into the animal, savoring its flesh. He felt strong. He felt powerful. He felt alive. Slowly, as he ate, it transformed into the shape of a man. He recognized the man. It was Mr. Hadley, the man who had stopped him from hurting Jake. First, he was horrified, but soon he began to feel a dark satisfaction. He had stopped Paul from hurting Jake. Didn't he know Jake deserved it? He had protected them because he was like them, and he deserved to suffer like they did. Paul howled with delight and began to devour the man piece by piece. When he woke up, he felt tired. He looked at the clock and saw that it was eight o'clock. With a start, he flung himself out of bed and rushed to get dressed. He had overslept. He was late for school and his parents would kill him. He was about to rush downstairs when he realized it was still dark outside. He looked at his phone and saw that it was eight at night. He had slept through the whole day? His mother would kill him. He didn't want to face his mother yet, and he felt tired. He sank back onto his bed and went back to sleep. If his mother was angry, she would wake him. But he was too tired. He just 
needed to sleep. He had been dozing for maybe five minutes when his mother burst into the room and demanded to know where he had been and why he hadn't answered her phone call. He felt confused and asked her what had happened, and she marched him downstairs to look at the TV. He watched as a news reporter stood outside the high school. He saw the headline, Teacher Mauled by Wolf. Paul felt a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. They hadn't announced the name, but he knew it was Mr. Hadley. He looked at his mom and apologized, telling her he had skipped school. She was still worried, but after a long time, she finally let him go back to bed. He felt bad for Mr. Hadley at first, but soon that faded. He remembered his dream, and he knew that he deserved to suffer for protecting Jake and his friends. Paul had worried for a moment the police would suspect he had killed Mr. Hadley, but he saw the footage on the news. It was clearly a wolf that killed Mr. Hadley. They would never suspect a scrawny high school kid had been responsible. Paul smiled. He felt powerful for the first time in his life and he liked it. He curled up in his bed and slept a peaceful, dreamless sleep. The next day, Paul went to school wearing his jacket. Everyone seemed to be in either a state of shock or mourning for Mr. Hadley's death. As he walked through the school, he got looks that were a mixture of horror and loathing when they saw his jacket. Even if they didn't think Paul was responsible, it still felt wrong to most of them to see him wearing what looked like a wolf pelt, like Paul was mocking Mr. Hadley's death or flaunting it in their faces. Paul just gave them a sly grin as he walked by them. He was mocking Mr. Hadley and all the rest of them. They were all weak. They were prey and they were scared, and he relished it. He felt like laughing, though he restrained himself on that front. He did feel like celebrating his kill, though, and he made sure to find Jake and his friends. He didn't find the bullies until the school met in the gym to mourn Mr. Hadley. When he saw them sitting in the bleachers, he walked up behind them and sat down. He watched all four of them for a long time before they noticed him. When they saw him sitting behind them, he flashed them a wicked smile. What do you want, Kessler? Jake demanded. Paul smiled at them creepily for a long moment before responding. We have unfinished business, Paul said, and no one will save you this time, Whitman. Jake's eyes flashed with terror and Paul laughed. He followed them for the rest of the school day, keeping a close eye on Jake and his friends. When school ended, they practically ran for their doors. Paul only laughed. Later that night, he dreamt of chasing four deer through the woods. They tried running in different directions and hiding, but he could smell them. They were sweating with fear, and he could hear their hearts racing. One by one, he killed them, tearing into their flesh and savoring their fear, until only one deer remained. He was bigger than the other three, and he had a large rack with five points on either side. He was tall, and he looked like he weighed over 300 pounds. When he saw Paul coming, he tried to run, but Paul cornered him and began closing in on him. The stag didn't try to run. He raised his head and stared at Paul with a defiant look in his eyes. Paul sensed that he was about to charge and he tensed, getting ready to move. The stag charged at him and Paul jumped to the right before springing towards the stag and tackling it to the ground. He managed to pin the animal, but its antlers gouged deep into his side. He snarled in pain and began to tear into the stag's side. It tried fighting him, but it was too weak and Paul killed the animal slowly and painfully. With blood dripping from his mouth, he raised his head to howl. But as he did, he woke up. Paul was in the cafeteria. His mouth and clothes were caked with blood, and he felt exhausted. His side ached, and he realized there was a long gash running from his hip to his shoulder on his left side. He looked around him and saw what was left of the cafeteria. It looked like it had been hit by a storm, and at the center of the storm was a boy. His body was mangled and mauled, but Paul could tell that it was Jake. Paul knew that he had killed all four boys, and he began to panic. He had killed them, and the police would be there soon if they weren't there already. He ran from the cafeteria, trying to find an exit. After running for what felt like forever, Paul had found somewhere safe. The police hadn't arrived yet, but he heard sirens as he fled the school. He ran until it felt like his legs would give out, and he found himself back at the gas station, standing next to the dumpster. He realized what he had done. He had murdered five men. He knew he had to get rid of the jacket before he killed anyone else. He stripped it off as quickly as he could and reached out to throw it in the dumpster. Right as he was about to let go, though, the world swirled around him. He was back in the woods. He saw flashbacks from his past, of when Jake and his friends had bullied him. He saw how mercilessly they picked on him, and he saw people standing by, watching it happen. He saw all his pain and humiliation on display, and no one did anything to help. Then, when he couldn't take it anymore, a wolf stalked silently past him. Paul watched as the wolf saved him from his bullies and tore apart the onlookers. He walked over and began to lick Paul's wounds, and help the version of himself from his vision. The wolf sat by him protectively, and he stood back up on his feet. Paul saw himself, and he looked scared. The wolf began to circle him, 
drawing closer and closer, and with horror, Paul knew what was about to happen. The wolf leapt at Paul and sunk its teeth into his leg. Paul watched as the boy in his vision cried out in pain and terror, but Paul felt nothing. He was a passive observer in his own death. As he watched, he knew he had a choice. He had to either kill the wolf or let the boy die, but there was no other option. He saw himself, but for the first time, it was through eyes that weren't his own. For the first time, he didn't see a poor, helpless victim. He saw a weak, pathetic boy who wouldn't even stand up for himself. The wolf was a murderer. Worse than that, it was a monster, but it wasn't weak. Paul didn't feel anything for the boy anymore. He wanted the boy to die. As the wolf tore into the boy's leg, Paul stepped forward and grabbed a large rock and looked down at the terrified boy, bringing the rock down on his head. As the boy died, the wolf walked away. Paul looked at the body with disgust. Finally, he walked away too, covered in thick black fur. A junkie sat outside the gas station, staring at a strange boy. He looked terrified, and as the junkie watched, he stripped off a jacket. As the junkie watched, he recognized the jacket and the boy. In terror, he leapt to his feet and ran for the boy. But before he could stop him, the boy put on the jacket, and the junkie watched as he transformed into a wolf. The wolf looked at him with unconcerned eyes, and he stalked away into the woods behind the gas station. No one ever knew what became of Paul Kessler or the large black wolf. But every so often, when the townspeople walked the streets at night, they claimed to feel an evil presence, as if they were being watched by some monster. Some of them even claimed to see a shadow, the shadow of a wolf following them home. <laughs>